Well, of course, when you start shaking your hips, he does, you know, you tell him, do exactly like that, and it goes. Just fun. You know about that, eh? Oh, that's the best part of the drumming. When you just let your bum do the work. <laughs> Jazz histories haven't had much to tell so far about whose bums it was that did the drumming. Now, that makes sense. Jazz is a type of music. And one of the main differences between music and other forms of art is that it is a sound art. So it makes sense. Jazz is, you know, when we want to write jazz histories, then we become interested in recordings and forms of sounds. So the kinds of histories that we write are very much dependent on the kinds of uh, sources that we use. And if we want to write the history of jazz in Montreal, where we can't really, um, we can't really use recordings because there weren't very many that were done by the musicians who worked here in the early 20th century. And so we have to use other kinds of sources in order to get to that history. Some of the sources that we might use are official pictures, for instance, of a band like Myron Sutton's Canadian Ambassadors of Rhythm. By the way, this is a great resource uh, about jazz in Montreal. Burgundy Jazz, the producer David Eng, did an amazing job reconstructing some of that history. So we might use official pictures of this band, Myron Sutton's Canadian Ambassadors, and we could write an entire chapter about that. We can write about, you know, who was the smallest member of the band, the tallest. <laughs> Tuxedo fashion in the 1930s, um, at the times when mustache were potentially more fashionable than today. We might write a lot about these kinds of pictures, but if we look just at official pictures, we might also miss parts of that history. But I was the one who was with them up in the north, all through the north. I was the girl singer. But funny, you know, if they had pictures, I don't remember seeing any pictures of myself with them, you know. I, I see them standing all together, Canadian ambassadors, but they're, they're just the man standing where they have a picture. That I don't know where it could be that they had with me, taken with me in it, you know, because I've never seen a... I think I seen it at the time they t had it taken and Mighty Sutton had it, but now when I see everything advertised, it always shows the, just the men. But I was the girl singer with them all through there, all through the north. <laughs> yes, I, I enjoyed that. That to me, that was a lovely experience. So it's important. It's important as a historian that when you write histories, we look at as many sources as possible in order to get a broad picture. But even when we look at very, a, the, a lot of materials, different materials, the kinds of histories that we write are also influenced by the kinds of questions that we ask the archive. If we get to the archive of jazz in Montreal, for instance, and we ask who were the great jazz soloists, where instrumentalists in particular, we're most of the time going to get a story that deals with men instrumentalists. If we ask questions about who were the important big bands and who were the important members of those ensembles in Montreal, well, we're also going to get a story that focuses primarily on men. And so we have to ask different kinds of questions in order to see where were the women. So my point is, when you walk into an archive and there's a bunch of boxes of relatively old pictures and relatively old recordings, um, it doesn't magically start organizing itself into something that makes sense. You ask the archive a question and materials start coming to you almost magically, but you know, after also some, some hard work, and then it starts organizing itself in a narrative that makes sense. So the project that I'm introducing to you today uh, is part of my dissertation, and the main question that I asked in my dissertation is, where were the women in the history of jazz in Montreal in the 30s and 40s? I wanted to know, well, I knew that they must have been there, so I thought I need to find them in the archive. And when I started asking that question to the archive, where well, I, started I, I started finding them in other kinds of places than I expected them, and in particular, as dancers. So I'm going to talk about that particular section of my PhD uh, dissertation today, where I talk specifically about uh, the dancers who were active, uh, the professional theatrical dancers who took an important, who played an important role in the golden age of jazz in Montreal. 
And so once again, trying to move away from looking at the history of jazz, especially in the 30s, as musician-centric, and kind of broadening the scope a little bit to see that musicians were accompanying a dancer. In this case, this is Ethel Bruno. And perhaps even broadening even more the scope to recognize the club here that was Rockhead's Paradise, most likely in the early 50s, and also the fact that upstairs there seemed to be other entertainers hanging out, having a drink, working together with the musicians. So those, that's the kind of picture that I want, um, that I want to get at, and that I, I'd like us to get better at imagining when we listen to records of early jazz, and in particular when you think about jazz in Montreal. So Montreal in the 1930s was the kind of place where anything could happen, or so are the words of Myron Sutton, who was a saxophone player at that time. I saw Johnny Hodges come in here and blow my horn. I saw that guy Puff Jaws. Anyone knows who that is? Dizzy Gillespie. Come in here. Uh, Duke Ellington came in and sat behind the bar. So Montreal was an important center if bands, very famous bands from the United States came here. Herb Johnson, a saxophone player, said, I played in practically every club in the city of Montreal since I came here in 1935, and I tell you, you knew you were in showbiz when you were working at Rockhead's Paradise or the Café Saint-Michel. It was like transporting yourself to Harlem. So Montreal had a big jazz scene, one that was very important, and also that made Montreal relatively unique in comparison to other centers. Um, in the United States and Western Europe. Montreal was one of the only large centers in North America um, that uh, still allowed uh, the selling of alcohol during Prohibition. So that drew in a lot of tourists looking for entertainment combined with alcohol. Montreal had a particularly tolerant attitude towards sex work and the underworld in comparison to other centers. Um, and above all, Montreal was recognized as a show town, so the tourists who came here to visit the city saw it as a place where you would have really fantastic shows. Um, invariably, so those are the words of Dennis Brown, who is a drummer who uh, participated in that time period, the acts would get their music played better in general in Montreal because that was how everybody made a living. You essentially in this town were a show drummer or a show musician. That means you played music behind a dancer, behind an act. So not just a music that uh, people went out to listen to, but people actually went to watch jazz on the variety stage in accompaniment to um, theatrical dancers. And when asked by the interviewer who was uh, doing this interview if perhaps musicians in New York or Boston weren't doing the exact same thing, he answered, oh, no, no, not necessarily. I mean, here it was a show town. All the musicians somewhere along the line, the ones I knew, you played shows. And as I said, most of the shows were so jazz and Afro-oriented because even when I played places like Café du Nord, sure enough, some of these dancers would come out that had been in rock heads and show up there. So, like, you still got a taste of it, along with playing with Michel Louvain, and Fernand Gignac, or whoever, but there would be very often a singer or a dancer who was out of the States who was black, so even in those clubs, you were still swinging. So jazz in Montreal was something that people danced to. You either went in a dance hall, you saw a big band and you danced to jazz in that, those kinds of spaces, or you saw jazz on the variety stage with primarily, so there were comedians, there were jugglers, all kinds of acts, but because Montreal had a large francophone population, uh, in general, the traveling entertainers who came here, well, we welcomed a lot of dancers in comparison to comedians. Um, jokes don't work so well in general when you don't know the language in which the comedian speaks. So this is from dancers Dave and Tressy, who came to Montreal in 1921, and they said, at last we are out of New York, the furthest since April was Philadelphia until this day. So they were traveling quite a bit. And believe me, this part of Canada is great. 10% beer, 30 cents a quart. I don't know what that means. Probably not too expensive. Best brandy, one dollar a pint. Seems like living up here, with the exception of meeting so many French people who do, do not speak English. But they're great people to be around. The act is going great. You know, they don't care much for talking acts, so we have no talking and very little singing, but a world of dancing. We are all to the mustard. So certain particularities of Montreal was a francophone city, was really a show town, a place where jazz was a music that people danced to. And so dancers were really important here, both um, in bringing the people in, in making sure that the clubs were full, in bringing the money in the clubs, but also in the advertisement. Here's how jazz was advertised in the 1930s. So you can read, Swing is King at the town's sepia high spot, a new and fast-moving floor show direct from world-famous 
Harlem. Now, whether that was true or not depended on the cases. Sometimes the, the entertainers uh, were based in Montreal, but that didn't quite uh, make a difference for the advertisement. In this case, there was La Lolita, the heat wave advertised, B. Morton, the torrid singer, Myrtle Wilson, the exotic dancer, Gladys Ridley, the sepian sophisticate. And you can see below there with Miney Sutton and his orchestra. Here's a similar ad from the Montmartre. I don't know if you can see it well, but the main focus, obviously, doesn't seem to be on the musicians. It's still there. The smallest available font on the ad says Miney Sutton's orchestra. But it seems that the main focus is on the women, in particular, the dancers. Another ad from Connie's Inn, bringing Harlem to Montreal. We can see some instruments, but really, it doesn't seem to be the sound of jazz. Um, that sold so well at the time. When you advertise a performance of jazz, it seems like it was the bodies of non-white women, of black women, who, um, who were used in advertisement strategies to bring the people in. So today, when we want to celebrate the important contributions of people who have um, contributed to Montreal's jazz scene, we paint them on walls like we did with Oscar Peterson not so long ago and Oliver Jones not so long ago as well. Well, back then, it was the entertainers the dancers, and the women dancers in particular, who were painted on the walls. So they really played an important part in the articulation of a scene for jazz in Montreal, and they were really um, the, reasons why, um, the reasons why people came in to see those shows. So travelers, uh, entertainers traveled through different centers uh, in the United States and in Canada. Uh, for most of them, Montreal was one stop amongst many. But several uh, entertainers uh, eventually settled in Montreal because actually compared to the United States um, where um, Montreal's race relations were much less institutionalized at the time. So in many cases, um, performers like, uh, for instance, Ethel Bruno came here. Uh, she came here in 1953 with Cab Calloway's orchestra. And she thought, wow, this is a lot, um, um, you know, yeah, race relations here in Montreal and in Canada more broadly are different from the Jim Crow laws that she had known in the United States. So Ethel Bruno was born in Kingston, Jamaica, and then she moved to Harlem when she was three or four years old, and she learned to dance in one of the most important dance capitals in the world. And she came to Montreal, and she's been teaching um, for, uh, since 1964 there some of the things that she had learned in Harlem when she was a young, um, when, she was, uh, when she started to dance. Mary Brown was another dancer who was born in the United States, um, in Baltimore in 1927, and she came to Montreal after the Second World War. Um, apparently she had a choice between going to Cairo and Montreal, and she picked Montreal and had to buy winter boots very quickly <laughs> when she arrived here. Uh, and she spent most of her performing life in Montreal as well. Another, one, another dancer, actually in this case Olga Spencer, you can see her in the center there, that's at the Montmartre, one of the clubs in Montreal in the mid-30s. Uh, she was born in Montreal, but she also traveled to Harlem and to the United States to learn there. And so there was a lot of uh, movement between dancers who came from here or came from elsewhere, settled here, traveled through here. Uh, Olga Spencer was born in uh, 1908 or 1909 in Montreal. And those three dancers were actually born in Montreal and they spent most of their careers here in Montreal. So on the left you have Tina bain Verretten, in the middle Bernice Jordan, and on the right you have Mary Claire Germain. And so all of these dancers, they didn't travel much to learn, but they learned in other ways. They learned from the traveling entertainers who came to the city here. Bernice Jordan in particular, in her oral history, I showed some excerpts of that. She talks quite a bit about um, how important traveling entertainers were in diversifying her offer in a way. So she had to change her dance routines almost every week, um, sometimes every two weeks. But she learned new songs, she learned new dance moves, and she learned all of that mainly through the traveling dancers who came to the city um, and were often hosted um, by local bands of jazz musicians. So I spoke about how unique Montreal was, but I also said a few words about how connected Montreal was to urban, other urban centers in the United States and Western Europe. So when dancers came here, they, were, um, they met a band, for instance, at Rockhead's Paradise or the Café Saint-Michel. Those were important clubs um, actually located at the corner of De La Montagne and Saint-Antoine in Montreal, for those who know the area a bit. Now, if you go there now, 
there's not much left. Uh, I was just walking there yesterday and it's a big parking lot. So you have to uh, be quite good at imagining or actually there's um, a fantastic iPhone app that you can use if you, if you go there and you can actually see pictures of Rockhead's Paradise and um, the Café Saint-Michel and what they actually looked, looked like back then. So there's not much of that left anymore um, today, definitely. But yeah, Montreal was both unique and well-connected on that kind of circuit. And so you had a band, uh, Miney Sutton, for instance, he held a number of long-term engagements um, in clubs like Connie's Inn, The Terminal. So he'd be there for one year, two years. Um, Alan Wellman was a well-known trumpet player. He held long-term engagements at Rockhead's Paradise, Louis Metcalf at uh, the Café Saint-Michel. And so these ensembles pretty much stayed in a club and welcomed traveling entertainers who kind of traveled with a number of um, you know, practices that were used to, knowledges, repertoires that they were used to. Um, and so what happens when, you know, you have a band, they're used to play together, and there's an entertainer or a dancer who's traveling, and he, and he or she um, arrives in the club, and they have to put together a performance. They have to put together a performance that most likely will be played three times a day for seven days, um, and, and that kind of went on 52 weeks a year for the musicians in the nightclubs, and so they had to change those performances quite often. So what happened? Well, the dancer would arrive and they would decide on a program together. They'd have rehearsals together during the day before the first performance. And most of the time, these dancers did not come to Montreal necessarily with uh, sheet music uh, that they wanted the musicians to learn. Um, actually, I'll let Alan Wellman, uh, actually Herb Johnson first, explain how that worked out. Saxophone player Herb Johnson says, a great many colored musicians did not learn um, to play their instrument in an institution. They could play them by ear in any key, but they didn't learn to read for the simple reason, who am I going to work with? Who's going to hire me? They certainly wouldn't work in the symphony. Playing these little rinky-dinky clubs that we had in the variety shows here, most of the time we played without music, so what are you going to learn? Alan Wellman explains how he puts together the music for performances. He says, you couldn't buy arrangements in those days for six-piece band worthwhile. John Kirby, that's the only thing that they had out. Some old pieces, if they wanted an arrangement of that, Honeysuckle Rose, you know, or Sunny Side of the Street, things like that in those days, you know? John Kirby, he didn't have no music for that, so I used to write those tunes, you see? And I'd write for all the show people. I'd write for the band, for them, and I'd make my money off the people in the show, you see? A lot of them didn't bring charts. A lot of them, you sat down and they say, give me a couple of chords of this, a couple of chords of this, you see? I wouldn't have time to write the music for the first couple of days. I didn't know who was coming in. And the first night, if the music didn't go down the way the girl explained it to me, she'd say the band was no good. I had to fix it up. So what I find particularly interesting here is that it, doesn't, it tends to reverse some of the assumptions that we have between the jazz ensemble and the singer or the dancer. We tend to assume that the jazz ensemble played the music and that the dancer danced to it how, regardless of the music, the actual song um, that, that the band had chosen. But actually, it seems like it was the dancers and the singers who traveled around and came to the rehearsal space and said, hey, how about we do these songs? Um, how about we do this song? How about we do this, this song in this particular way, in this particular format? So because in a city like Montreal there was a different access to recordings and to radios as in other cities in the United States, the traveling entertainers played a really important role in kind of taking those knowledges in different cities on the circuit of um, the black variety stage. So let's hear a little bit, I don't know, I'd like to welcome um, Andres Vial, are you in backstage yet? I think he's coming. <laughs> I think he's coming. Hey, right on time. <laughs> yes. So Andres Villar did something that I think is absolutely amazing. So some, from of those um, oral histories, actually at some point, uh, the women start singing uh, those songs. And I worked with um, Andres and we, actually he, he actually listened to these, these songs quite, for quite some time and he actually worked out a way to accompany them. So this gives us, I think, a really good sense of the kinds of songs uh, that women used to sing on the variety stage and on jazz stages in Montreal. So I'm introducing 
uh, Tina Baines first, who talks about an audition process. I went down for, uh, for an audition. And when you go for an audition now, you're going to laugh. You have to sing that song they say, uh, everybody was singing, you know, consider yourself, you know. So uh, he says, all right. I said, in the key of F. I says, okay. I said, I come for the chords. He says, hit it. And I went, consider yourself at home. Consider yourself part of the family. And then I'd go, dum diddly dum, dum die. And I go, dum dee, die. Diddly dim did. And he says, hold it, hold it. And I says, and what is it? He says, what's all this dum diddly? I said, well, I says, I had lib, okay? He says, but what about the words? I says, I don't know the words. <laughs> I said, no, I hear that song all the time. I don't know the words. I said, I'm just that living, you know, dum diddly dum dum die. I said, I'll get it sooner or later if we're going to use it in the show. He says, well, I do declare. This guy was fantastic. And uh, he says, I'll let you know if we're going to take it. I says, as you wish, as you wish. Before you know it, he called me. He says, you're in, you know. I said, why? He said, because I like you have guts. <laughs> I said, good for you, good for you. I said, you don't know who you got in your hand. I said, you got something good. And from then on, we hit it. Here's another song by uh, Bernice Jordan. You had to sing um, many old numbers. I used to love one, 100 years from today, I used to love that number. Don't save your kisses, just pass them around. You'll find my reason most logically sound. Who's gonna know that you've passed them around 100 years from today? Why crave a penthouse fit for a king? You're nearer heaven on Mother Earth's knee. If you had millions, what would they all mean? 100 years from today. So let's laugh and sing, make love the thing. Be happy, happy, happy while you may. There's always one beneath the sun who's bound to make you feel that way. You say, the sun is shining. That's a good sign. Cling to me, darling, and say you'll be mine. Remember, darling, we won't see it shine 100 years from today. Oh, my darling, 100 years from today. But when I sang it those days, I sang it a key higher. As you get older, I guess you get more hoarse, and you have to sing lower. And I find, I guess I'm hoarse, but uh, I try to do the best I can. I don't know how it's going to sound, but I guess it, that's me. <laughs> it's Bernice. I think that's pretty amazing. <laughs> And so in the context of this particular interview, she was asked specifically, so was it jazz that you sing? Did you actually sing jazz? And here's what she answered. With the Canadian ambassadors, did you sing a lot of jazz? Or blues yeah. A company, or a big mix? We sang everything. Oh, I can not know, fast one. I know why I've waited, know why I've been blue. I was meant for someone exactly like you. Why should we spend money on a show or two? No one does those love scenes exactly like you. You make me feel so grand. I want to hand the world to you. You seem to understand each foolish little dream. I'm dreaming, scheme, I'm scheming. I I know why my mommy, she taught me to be true. She meant me for someone exactly like you. you know, use your hands and your eyes and, and your hips. And that was one of those fast ones and there was others more fast, but I guess I'm not the kind of voice to sing today. <laughs> 
So those are the kinds of sounds that people heard, and those are the kinds of performances. Actually, this is one of the voices that people in Montreal used to hear when they went out to see a jazz show. So where did Bernice Jordan le learn these songs? Well, most of the time she learned them from traveling dancers, traveling singers, traveling entertainers. So here's the last one by Bernice Jordan that she learned actually from Pearl, ba Burley, Pearl Bailey sorry, when she came to Montreal. Goody, goody. So you met someone who'd set you back on your knees. Goody, goody. And you know, no, 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 please. Goody, goody. Something going on your way to something like that. I can't remember the words. <laughs> and I used to do that goody, goody. So once the performers had picked a particular number of songs that they agreed on that they would perform um, on a particular show, or in a particular number, they started working on an actual format in which the songs would appear. So they wouldn't just, uh, most of the time, it's in particular for dance acts, there wouldn't be just one song. There would most of the time be a couple of songs, one after the other. So you might have a couple bars of, um, I got rhythm, I got the I don't know the words. Do you know them? Anyway, so you might have a couple bars of I Got Rhythm and then a couple bars of uh, How High the Moon, a couple bars of uh, Black and Tan Fantasy. And so they worked on uh, a kind of a medley uh, that would feature the skills of the singer or of the dancer. And they would agree on, on that particular format beforehand. Um, so here's exactly um, how Dennis Brown, I've introduced him before, how he, um, the system that he had for tempos. I had my little system for tempos, says Dennis Brown. For a dancer's routine, for example, there may be many changes in tempos, especially some of the Afro-Cuban dances, where they would go into a fast thing and then they would go to a stop and slow, you know, like various things. You had no music, you just had to go blind. No, and by no music, he means no music sheets. I would ask for cue points and I drew a little picture of a pose. I had like little pen and ink things on there on my cue sheets of poses like when they'd hit a certain position, the dancers, like an abrupt change of tempo and mood and possibly this is what, and, and this is what I liked. I got to the point of playing so many dancers that I could pick up, okay, whether their roots, like say they came from New York, like after the first few steps, I could pick up whether their roots were West Indian or Cuban or straight American and vary the rhythm and feeling accordingly. So sometimes I'd get into a calypso-ish type of thing and other time into a much more Cuban thing and I'd just say more like a shake dancer, street American, New York, Harlem type of thing, you know? <laughs> So what I find particularly interesting in, in this statement by Dennis Brown is that it doesn't seem to be the dancer who's setting up the tempo and who's telling the dancer what to do. It seems like he's uh, actually drawing certain positions onto his cue sheet to remember what kinds, when to change the tempo, when to change the mood. And so it seems like the dancers, the entertainers, the singers play the very important creative role in putting together these performances. So not just in the overall format, but um, they actually, um, the ways in which musicians who were active in that era, so including Myron Sutton, Herb Johnson and Dennis Brown, the way in which they talk about how they learned their skill as jazz musicians is very much indebted to the context in which they played, which was the black variety stage. Here Myron Sutton talks about learning to solo. Say I was playing at Connie's Inn, so that would have been in 1933, 1934 in the case of the Canadian ambassadors. You had to put a girl up once in a while to go around and sing at the tables, eh? This is how I learned to ad-lib quite a bit, because we had a small band, a small group, say a five-piece group. So you'd have to put a girl up, and when those girls went up, they sang or danced at every table. So let's say you, ha you had uh, your alto, saxophone, your tenor, your trumpet, eh? and then drums and piano. Well, we used to, to each take a chorus in rotation. Like I'd finish a chorus and the trumpet player would take a chorus and the tenor man would take a chorus and back to me. This is how we learned. This is actually how I learned to ad-lib, that is to improvise at his instrument quite a bit while she's singing or dancing. You take an ad-lib on, say you're playing a T for two, for instance, or anything like that, you ad-lib and break it up and play the way that you thought you wanted to play it, eh? You'd experiment and if you made a mistake this time, Next time you play it well, nobody is listening to you anyway, it's listening to the girl singing. So a lot of experiment and you learn to ad-lib, that's all. That's also in this kind of context that musicians learn to riff, that is to improvise kind of short patterns um, and together in, uh, while they're accompanying a singer or a dancer. So Herb Johnson talks about this. The band would automatically like create arrangements on the spot and riff. 
and do like the old jazz accompaniment is called a riff behind singers, especially singers were coming in with no music and we had three part harmony riffs going and we'd remember them. It was sort of the standard thing to do in this scene. This didn't happen in the white scene, this happened in this scene. Alan Wellman, the Seely Brothers, Rock Heads, they did the same thing. They would just right away look at each other and bam, it was there. It was just beautiful. The next show they did the same riff, you know? It was just unbelievable that they could do this. One last quote from Dennis Brown. Every move they made, the dancers, you caught everything that moved. A dancer coming in, you know, you might have in Hastings a drum beat on toms, and he does a kick, and I'd crash, you know? You accented everything, pointed everything up. Now, this was expected. This had to happen in the context of the music, and you still were like expected to be grooving, you know? As opposed to a drummer who just had to play the music and play very straight and go, he sings the drum beat again. Now, you had to also swing, or if it was Latin or Afro, you still had to maintain that feeling and catch. But I mean, it was a beautiful challenge. We used to get these write-ups in Montréal Matin, and invariably, when it came to a mention of the band, when it came to me, it was always about how I followed the dancers, la manière qu'ils suivent les danseurs. Now, you can talk about music only so long before it gets boring. You actually have to play some music and see some of that stuff in order to, for it to make some sense. So I'd like to invite on stage, I feel particularly honored to invite on stage Tanya Knights, who's a professional theatrical dancer, as well as Andre White and Martin Heslop, who are going to play with Andres Vial, and they're going to put together, or actually going to listen to a short clip by Bernice Jordan and take some of her advice in putting together a small performance for you. So um, Tanya Knights, Andre White, and Martin Heslop, thank you for being here. Thanks. Taping oh, you go, um, you feel to yourself, well, I've got to put my hands out. You, uh, you hold your hands out and you start, and the, bat, the drummer hits, boom, 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 boom. You go, da, 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 and you walk. Da, 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 and you walk. Da, 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 and you got your sticky chest, you get more stiff, da, 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 you go. Da 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 Shoo! 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 And you walk some more. Then you run your own all around the stage. You got all kind of different steps you have to do to different...
Tanya here demonstrated some of the things that Bernice Jordan actually explains in her oral history. So let's hear what Bernice Jordan, um, how she explains in her words and also through her body some of the things that we saw Tanya perform right now. Beats of the drum, but you have high, high heel shoes on and you got to slit up one side of your black satin dress, reserve style dress with the slip and your leg comes through with these high shoes and you just walk and prance. Don't care how short you are. If, if, you, if you're short and you've got a tiny body, which I had then, you look nice. You could look at yourself in the looking glass when they, some clubs had the looking glass and the different color lights on you. You look like some glamorous girl, especially in those days you wore your hair in upsweep. You made you look taller. You look so gracious. You just felt, oh boy, this is, this is heaven. Then when you come off the stage, you know who you really are. You're not that gracious. <laughs> but on the stage, you feel like a billion dollars prancing like that to the satin doll. It's this lovely poise, you know. It brought out any feeling of, if you felt like you were going to be such a lady. You want to be such a sophisticated human being at the moment. You enjoyed that. Like a girl loves her ballet and she's on her toes. She's belling all around. That's a, that's a beautiful thrill as a dancer. Is that what kept you going and working and with well, your career? Well, I enjoyed it. I wasn't working. It was working, but it was fun. It was it was it was like going to a party every day. That's what it was like when you had to work to dance. I think even Tina and Mary Claire and all those girls. I'm sure that they tell you the same thing. They didn't feel like they were working. They were in, they go to work and, and it, it's dan dancing was so much fun. It's, it, it made you, f you always want to be learning something new in, in your routines and that's how you learn many different steps because you had the big rehearsal hall or big rehearsal nightclub floor. You'd say, try to do it this way, try to do it that way and boy, you'd make up many beautiful steps. Yes. Did you ever have, do you ever, did you ever do any musical dance challenges with the drummer? Oh yes. How was that musical conversation? Well, it's, it's beautiful. You you do a step like you do your half like da 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 and he'd do this da 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 and you might go over the world do the back step you know back tap tap da 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 you did it again with him. You see, you do it first. Then he beats it, and then you're doing it again. When you're doing it again with him, you're doing it more terrific because you're doing it wild because you have the drum beat behind you. Oh, it's fun. <laughs> it was fun in those days, yeah. Would you, rather, would you converse, converse, uh, can, uh, have a conversation? Like he would do something no, he else. doesn't know you're going to do it. And then he, you would do something else? No, no, he doesn't know you're going to do it. You might have to be told that this is what you have to do, it's a finale. Now you have this, you're going to do this step, do, do, you, they tell you do something, this is the finale. Each one get out and do what they want to do. That drummer has to have that feeling that he knows what you're doing. And you might do that step while he's just playing cool drums. Then when he knows what you're doing, when you do it again, he's beating it right with you. It's, 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 it's right, the same beat, you know what I mean? It's like going around the world, they call it, around the world when you're twirling your legs around in the back and you're leaning forward, or when you're doing the pull the trenches. You're sliding, your legs are going back, and your hands are going forward. Well, he can pull the trenches good, and he keep right up to, 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 to when you finish, pull the trenches, and you get up and go, ah, he's out ah, with you. That's pretty. You know, it's, it's, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> okay, so explanation and performance. One of the other um, ways in which I've been able to, as a historian, of course, as performers, we tend to understand certain things from and, and kind of reinterpret, as you did really well, uh, some of the things that Bernice uh, explains here. Um, but in the archive, there's also um, two small scores that we can access that Dennis Brown, Dennis Brown transcribed. Um, and he says, I used to use um, this particular pattern when I accompanied shake dancers at Rockhead's Paradise in the early uh, 50s. And you can note up there the indication for fringes and tassels. So that was the type of costumes that shake dancers danced. So what does it sound like, Andre? <laughs> Here's another one. Oh. Shake, shake. 
<laughs> yes, like a shake. Here's another one for a slow or medium Afro dancer. I think these are really cool because when we can access you know, some of these drum patterns and then we listen to recordings from that era, well, I think it's easier to imagine the kinds of movements that a dancer might have done to those particular drum patterns at the time. So I'd like to um, once again introduce, so from, uh, from this research that I did with the oral histories, I shared that research with um, Andres Vial and with the musicians and dancer, and they've put together uh, about of a 10 to 15 minute performance that puts together some of the things that I discussed, so including trading fours, kind of a medley type of thing uh, with songs that they've agreed on before. So it was really interesting to see them rehearse this afternoon and to, uh, to actually see happen some of the things that seem to have happened to the women I've been studying for a couple of years. So deciding together what's the tempo, deciding together you know, what, who should start to solo first and who should go second. So uh, a very interesting process to see that. So I'd like to leave the stage to you for that performance.
So I think we can learn a lot about the past and about jazz history by listening to recordings. We can learn about the past if we look at pictures, if we listen to oral histories. But it seems to me like performance wraps it up together. Thank you very much. Tanya Knight, the dancer, professional dancer. Andres Vial, who played the piano tonight. Martin Heslop, who played the bass. And Andre White, who played the drums for us. Thank you very much. Yes. So there is some time for questions and answers. I know uh, there's some members in the audience who might also have to contribute. Um, I sent an invitation to people who played music quite some time ago and danced. Uh, so if these people are interested in coming to the stage and answering some questions, that would be great. Otherwise, Tanya is happy to answer some questions if you want to know what it's like. Yes? Yes. Um, oh, okay, then. Hi. Well, um, I, know, I know it's kind of funny. Andre, you remember me? Yes. Actually, Ralph. that's my mother. I know, Mr. Wim. Bernice Jordan. Yes, welcome here. <laughs> I'm yeah. so glad you made it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's fantastic what you did. Thank you so much. Yeah. Would you please come on stage so people can, um, can I don't know, I'm sure, you, I'm sure people have maybe questions for you, what it was like to grow up with a mother who, oh, yes. who was an, such an artist. So if you'd like, it'd be great, thanks. <laughs> Do you want to help? I don't know. Okay, well come, come up with us. So it's okay if all the questions are, to Mr. Wims and to Tanya Knight. Wait, so, should I keep this mic? Yeah, of course. So Mr. Wims is the son of uh, Bernice Jordan, uh, whom we heard singing and dancing earlier today. So thanks for coming up to the well, stage with the, me. Well, the story is, is that um, my mother um, was an entertainer from day one. She always was. And if you know a little about her history, um, um, I, I wasn't able to see everything on it, but uh, the, the history was that uh, from the time that she was very young, she realized that's what she wanted to do rather than stay in school. So she started to hang around uh, Rockhead's Paradise and uh, the Cafe Saint Michel, and uh, she would sing and she, and she would dance. And uh, I learned how to be able to, well, I was just a young boy when she was doing a lot of her dancing and everything, so she used to drag me along to the nightclubs and so, uh, uh, when they were rehearsing and such and so it was really quite an experience for me because uh, I, I think they mentioned something about shake dancers and so on and so forth and the truth of the matter is is that as a five-year-old I was exposed in the dressing room to these shake dancers who were practically were naked and uh, it was really <laughs> it was just like a coming of age a little too soon but anyways neither <laughs> neither here or there but the um, one thing people did not really know about Rockhead's Paradise is that Rockhead's and the same Michel, Rockhead's Paradise, um, most of the entertainers and performers that performed at Rockhead's Paradise were American. And uh, if you and they were the ones who performed there and, and drew there. Now, a lot of the Canadian male and female who wanted to get into music they, they played mostly at the Café Saint-Michel, and there was another club just across the street from the lower entrance to Windsor Station called the Terminal Club, and they used to go there to jam, jam sessions and such, at a period of time. And so in growing up, I, um, I was exposed to music at a time. I, I love music, but I, I didn't have any talent. And so that, that was where the, uh, that's, so I became an appreci appreciator of music without being able to, to um, engage in it as much as I would like to. Um, a couple of friends of mine, I don't know if uh, you may know them, but Norman Marshall Vilnev was um, a young fellow who, we were best friends from the time we were like eight years old until about 12 or so. And uh, I remember my mother wanted, uh, she had me take music lessons. I was taught piano, like many um, blacks in the English black community there. We were taught piano by uh, Daisy Peterson Sweeney, Oscar Peterson's sister. And 
we had our piano lessons taken at um, the Negro Community Center at that time. And on a Saturday, that community center was really like a boys club for us, we, or a girls club. We, we went there and uh, the girls had to learn how to dance. And some of the boys did. And the boys had to learn the piano. And, uh, and so then it was really music that was inspired in the community there. And it's because uh, the area of Peel Street, St. Antoine, to Rose de Lima, or Rose de Lima, or Atwater, to Norta Dame Street, that was the community that we, we lived in. That was our community around the CN and the CPR station because our fathers, most of them worked there. Now, I remember that um, <clears throat> there's, there's, there's so many things. I, ask me other questions, ask me some questions. <laughs> I think they want to hear you talk more. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. Unless there are questions. Now it's it's it's. Maybe I wonder uh, how many days a week uh, your mother is. Uh, yeah, because it's our webcast. We need your. Oh yeah. Thanks. I wonder how many days a week could your mother work? Is, is they, in those days, you worked every day, every day of the that week, because in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, particularly in the 1920s, Rockhead's Paradise opened in 1927. But before then, there was music in the city. And really, um, Montreal, because it was the headquarters for the CPR and the CNR station where they trained, uh, they trained the sleeping car porters, what happens is that because of prohibition, if you must remember, in the rest of North America, you weren't able to drink in the 20s to the 30s, but you could drink in Quebec, and you could drink in Montreal. So this is what turned Montreal into a party town. And the people used to come in on the train, and they used to come in from Toronto, Ottawa, Boston, New York City. They would come to Montreal because they could, they could drink. And so it, um, all along St. Antoine Street, from Windsor Station all the way to Guy Street, on St. Antoine Street, there were nothing but clubs, all little clubs there at that time. And if you ever see any old pictures of uh, St. Catherine Street between, um, between Guy and, and, uh, and Peel, it was just lit up with movie theaters, clubs, and because everybody came to Montreal for that purpose. So she worked every night. And, and, uh, and of course, I lived with my, my grandmother and my mother. My grandmother did a day's work. She came from the West Indies, and, and of course, blacks who came from the West Indies, the males worked as porters, and the females worked in domestic, as domestic help, working in the rich homes up in Westmount. So I remember my, that my grandmother used to work up at these homes. But sometimes, she used to, she used to work at a, and I think it's a Hungarian club called the Samovar that existed at that time. And she used to work in the ladies' room. And the idea is, is that when the ladies came in, you supplied them with, uh, uh, with Kleenex and, and whatever they may need. And you, you were tipped because of it. And I can remember that sometimes when my mother couldn't take me to whichever club she went to to play, I would have to go with my grandmother because there was no one at home. So I used to sleep right where they checked the clothes, all the coats and everything. I used to sleep around there. But this is the, is the kind of life that existed at that time. And on St. Lawrence, Maine, there were two um, movie theaters, one called the Midway and the other called the Crystal Palace, right on the corner of um, St. Catherine Street and uh, St. Lawrence, Maine, St. Lawrence Street. And they used, to have, they used to have vaudeville in there in between the movies. They would show double features. And in between the double feature, they had a floor show. And so my mother was able, you know, she danced during that period of time. One of the things that I um, remember is that because my, parent, my mother was, in enter, it was an entertainer, during the 1930s, the Depression period of time, we, uh, 
our family really didn't suffer. We weren't rich, we were poor, but we didn't suffer because she could perform each evening and collect money, whereas other people were, you know, most of the, the rest of the population were on rations or they, uh, you know, and so therefore we, um, I, I don't remember not being able to have as much butter as I want or sugar or whatever while the others were being rationed because they brought money home, was always, money was always coming home. My grandmother, domestic, and my mother, in entertainment. And so then that, uh, that's a life I grew up in. And uh, it was a good childhood and a good community living. And as I don't know if my mother said, uh, if you got that bit, because um, this excerpt of her was taken from a uh, National Film Board documentary in which uh, they go into real detail. And she would say that, the most important thing was to bring money home for the family, and that's what she, and she, she, she says, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed, this is the only way that I could make a living, and that's the way it was. And she was an entertainer to the end. And I don't know if you, under, if you might understand the expression of an entertainer, in the sense that uh, the minute you have a bit of an audience, one or two people, and you're an entertainer, you tend to perform. And my mother always performed, and uh, um, I loved her, but at times I didn't like her because <laughs> she, she was always uh, performing, and, uh, and uh, it, was, it was something that, that, you know, if it's not a part of your nature, personality, or character, you find it very difficult to deal with, you know. And, of course, a lot of the, the, the women at that time, they, uh, part of the entertaining was a sort of pretension because you were performing all the time. If you're on stage or, or when you're in a crowd to control, the person who controls the audience is the entertainer. It doesn't matter even you know, in business or anything else. You know, and uh, that's the way it was. But um, it was a good life for us. I, I'm, I, I can't really complain about it. And, uh, and we were a close-knit family. That community was closely knit. And it was, it was bred on music. Music was the background for most of us, because that was the only, that, at that time, that was the only way to advance ourselves uh, in the community. The only job that male, black males got in the community at that time was being a porter. And the truth of the matter is, is there were many very, very qualified individuals in the community who came up from the Caribbean islands, and they had professions and such. But they couldn't get work here in the professions they were in, so they ended up having to work on the railroad. A lot of them uh, resented it very much because they thought it was a, it was a waste of their, their talent, but it wasn't there. And so then this is, was the period of time, that period of time, the 20s and the 30s and the 40s, and it was, uh, it was a, a great, I guess, time to, gr to grow up. I was, I was born in 37, and uh, I'm 80 today. So my mother would have been 100 if she was still alive because she's 20 years older than me. But the thing is, is that um, it's always been a part of, and that community will always be there. And the terrible shame of it is that when, they, when Mr. Rockets, when his son, Kenny Rockets, finally sold Rockets Paradise, they leveled it to the ground and just left an empty space. They never built anything there at all. They just left it like they, they wanted to blot out whatever existed there. But it was the club at that time, the club to go to. And a lot of the people who patronized it were, believe it or not, they weren't black. A lot of them who went to Rock Edge Paradise. They were whites from uptown who'd come downtown, it's called, and they enjoyed. They enjoyed the entertainment. They enjoyed the um, camaraderie. And when you see pictures, at that period of time, uh, you, you saw people of the two races at that time, white and black, who, um, who fraternized quite easily in that environment. There was no, there was no um, I would say, uh, no outward racism like you can see at times today in certain areas of, of wherever you live. But the fact of it is, is they, music brought them together. And um, I don't know if um, I don't know if you if you read very much, but I um, I 
I was a, a fan of Shakespearean theater being an English teacher, and I, I got a hold of a book, the latest book that was written, sort of like a biography of um, Christopher Plummer. And in the first two or three chapters, when he started to get around 15, 16 years old, being a rich kid in the community, he started to hang out with a lot of the rich people, rich French, English, Canadian people who lived in Montreal, and they used to hang out and go down to Rockheads and to the Saint Michel, and they would, they, he would talk about them staggering up Mountain Street at six, seven o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday, you know, in the middle of the week, because they were out, you were partying all the time. And, uh, you, and you, you, if you lived in the city, you went out and partied, and sure enough, you, whatever time you got home, you, you were up and went to work the next day. So it was a whole different, a whole different uh, kind of style of life that, at that time. And of course, it was young and things were happening then. So that's, you know, that was the way it is. And if yeah. there's nothing else. <laughs> Any okay. other questions? Else? Yes, there's one in the back. Yeah, Showgirls yeah. by Malin Lamb. Malin Lamb? Malin Lamb. Yeah. Okay. It's the director, and the, it's called. Um, Showgirls. Showgirls. Yeah. The story and of the legendary yeah. black and jazz. And the two scene. of them, and the, of the three girls, uh, the three women in that chorus line where they were together, um, the, Tina Baines is still alive. She's, uh, she was uh, 10 years younger than all of the others, but she's still, she's still alive today. And, uh, and yeah, it's funny how things, how things are and how they go. Yeah. I have a question. Um, you talked about how at the beginning, if you only listen to recordings and look at pictures, you might not get the whole scene that was going on. I'm just wondering from that time, are there any films and things like that of actual performances? Yes, in not in Montreal. In addition to interviews and things like that that you could use? Uh, yeah, not in Montreal. I looked no. far and wide, they, but they not in Montreal. They didn't. Uh, what happened is when jazz came up from Chicago, when it crossed over the border and came into Canada, uh, you must remember that um, Berlinger was the one who first started making records, a German, uh, a German inventor is the, who, who created RCA Victor. And he, f he found he, he was in conflict with his brother. And so when they moved to New York, so he, he came to Canada and patented, and they used to make all, they used to make a lot of the records in St. Henry, at RCA Victor in St. Henry, but they were not sold here. They were, made, they were made here and sent back to the States because the state was where the market was. Um, only a few sometimes used to be able to sneak a few from work and, and keep them here. But music was, was, um, was created for the American market. And it never, so a lot is missing. And if you, when you see showgirls, you'll see that a lot of the video sequences they show of the, of the chorus line dancing, they're basically the chorus line that existed in New York City during the time of Cab Calloway and Duke Ellington and everything. So you see, you don't see where Montreal, where Montreal is concerned, you see very few, very little live. Even there was, um, there was a band, American band leader who created an international band that played at the Cafe Saint Michel. His name was Louis Medcalf. Now he came up here and what he used to do because everybody used to jam and a lot of people like to go to the St. Michel to dance, they used to, they used to have him on radio, I don't know, on a Saturday. You know, they would, they would tape a show on the, on the radio and then play it back. Somehow those, those recordings were not kept on tape or there's no place to find them so it's lost again. See? And uh, so th these, these are some of the things that, uh, that happened at that time. And Andre, Andre's dad is, uh, is a, is a good, very good friend of mine. And uh, he taped um, uh, a Charlie Parker uh, jam session that Charlie Parker had at the, uh, at the Chaperie when he came to Montreal. And like, I mean, he had that on tape and like, I mean, it was so valuable. He was able, people would, uh, you know, would uh, pay them a lot to just get it and try to see if they could make, uh, you know, they could make, use it, but he never gave them the rights <laughs> to be able to take it. But anyway. 
There's a couple of films by Oscar Michaud. Uh, so he, because I spoke with Maylin Lamb, the producer of Showgirls, and I actually ha asked her, her that question because she had been looking actually far and wide for footage of uh, you know, actual Montreal-based dancers. And she said to me that the um, equipment at the time cost a fortune to bring down in those clubs. Mm -hmm. And so very rarely they were filmed. And one of the few filmmakers who did go into those clubs in the 30s was Oscar Michaud. And so you can see some of that in films like uh, Swing and 10 Minutes to Live. So those were films produced in the 1930s. And you can see some of that entertainment and, entertainment and the kind of connection between the musicians, the dancers. I think one of the ways in which, I mean, I think because these dancers traveled so much, I think there's points of connections between that. I'd like to think that. Uh, of course, we're not going to see mm -hmm. Bernice Jordan onto those videos. We're not going to see uh, Tina Baines written on those videos. But because they travel and they kind of shared uh, movements, they shared dance moves, they shared songs, I think there's a way in which we can um, imagine mm -hmm. what happened in Montreal through looking at those films by Oscar Michel. I just want to add one thing that she brought to mind when she said that uh, where in the, after the 1930s, when we were getting into the 40s, apparently um, they, uh, Drapeau was clamping down on stuff in the 50s when he did, but in the 40s, um, when prohibition, when prohibition had been absolved and you were able to drink everywhere, Montreal lost a little, a little bit of the uh, fervor for people to come here. So I can remember that during that period of time, a lot of the um, Canadian and American entertainers who made their home here, they had to go out into the province of Quebec on weekends and play in, in the little French towns. And they brought their music and they brought dancing to the French towns, so uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the French Canadians in, in the country could jitterbug and do a lot of these other dances. And this is what they brought. And I used to remember my, my mother would go away for the weekend and then uh, probably two weeks in the summer. She'd play it, I can remember, St. Gabriel de Brandon was a place that she would go for two weeks. And so this is where they had to leave the city. And then after the 40s, when it started to get to the 50s and they closed Rockheads down, a, a lot of it just dissolved up. And, uh, you know, and my, my mother left music and uh, worked at the post office, you see. So that's, this, is the, this, this was that period of time. All was, although it was a golden period, any way you look at it. Maybe for them, but when you grew up and, you, and you're around it, it it's, things were just happening. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, yes, I found myself kind of transported just by listening to your stories, but also by the performance. And I was struck by what you said about um, the dancer really having creative input into the music, and then that was, became very clear to me because um, I, was, I was struck by just how transported I was by that performance and the range of emotion, Tanya, that you brought to it, and the, um, particularly the humor in it. It really, it really just adds a whole other layer um, oh, yeah. to, what, to what's going yeah. on. Um, I was also struck by Bernice's statement that she didn't feel like she was working. And so I wondered, you know, as a historian, were you able to find in your interviews and in the archives how were the female singers and dancers paid in comparison with the male musicians? Were they treated as if they were working uh, or <laughs> as if they were going to partying, uh, to going to parties, as she said? And, and, you know, I would think that many of these women might be, um, well, I, I was, I'm struck by what you said, too, about um, being able to work through the 30s then and having mm -hmm. money to bring home. But compared with being a worker, let's say, in a Westmount home, how did your family fare? I think at that time, uh, everybody was paid evenly, which means that one of, the, one, of the, one of the drawbacks to it, which I learned later on, when uh, my mother was eligible to get a, a, a pension from the Musicians Guild. There was a branch in, uh, from the New York main branch, there was a branch in Montreal, and she paid her dues all the time into it, and so then when it became time for her to be able to collect, I sent a letter, or I wrote a letter to New York. And New York sent me a letter back to say that she is not eligible for a pension because she didn't, she didn't uh, they don't have any record of her putting any money in. Now this was one of the things that, that happened downtown. A lot of people performed at the, the Cafe Saint-Michel and Rockheads, and so on and so forth, and they didn't perform with a contract. What happened is the leader 
of the ban or that was paid. You see, it was paid at the end of the week or whatever it is, but that leader did not take a portion out to give to the to give to the musicians guild. So therefore they, you know, it was what, what little they might have got or how much they got, they took everything home. So there was no record. So she wasn't able to collect uh, any, any uh, um, insurance from that, any from the musicians guild. And a lot of people, a lot of Montreal musicians suffered from that. And uh, that, that, that did, they did not belong. And of course at that period of time, the Montreal branch of the Musicians Guild was controlled by, uh, you know, certain, you know, uh, peoples. <laughs> we say certain <laughs> peoples that control everything, and I don't need to go any further because you can draw the picture from there. But there was no money distinction like there is today where work was concerned. Everybody, if there were five people in the band, the money was divided up five ways. The leader did get a, an extra $10 because he was the leader. But um, the, there was, I can remember that I used to hang around with a lot of the, the musicians. Charlie Biddles was one. And I used to hang around with him, uh, 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 them an awful lot. And they were always having trouble with the Musicians Guild. There were certain clubs that would allow them to play without being a member of the Musicians Guild. So the Musicians Guild would blackball them to a certain extent, and they, uh, they would be they would ki be kicked out of the guild until they paid their dues paid to resurrect themselves. So they were always at odds with the Mus Montreal Musicians Guild. But this is, uh, this is the way it was during that time in the Depression. Whatever monies you got, you, you didn't think in terms of putting it aside for this or that, the other. It, it actually was the money that you used for, your, uh, for daily expenses just to survive and live. So um, there was no big difference between uh, the two groups, the two, between male and female. They got the same amount of money. They divided it up equally. A lot of the women in the oral histories I listen to and watch, uh, they talk about negotiating their contracts on their own too. So when they were hired as solo acts, for instance, Ethel Bruno and Mary Brown, they talk about going to the club and talking to, uh, to whoever was hiring them and having to negotiate on their own their contract. So that's pretty early uh, in the 1950s. There was a big difference between how the white acts were paid and how the black acts were paid though. Um, Ethel Bruno talks about a particular instance when she was performing in a club and there was a white dancer who was performing and she was paid about, um, well, at least twice the amount that she was paid. And so the dancer came to her and said, hey, it's not, actually, the, Ethel Bruno tells the story of, of, of that white dancer who came to her and said, you know, I'm actually paid a lot more money than you, uh, so you should probably talk to whoever is hiring us and, and potentially see if you can negotiate it higher. So in terms of the male, and, uh, male musicians and female dancers, um, I, I, I mean, that's also what I got from the oral history, but in terms of white and black acts and dancers, there was a big difference. And also to imagine these women in the like, early 50s taking the tramway <laughs> to go and negotiate their own contracts with club owners, I think, um, yeah, is one of the things that I encountered along the way. But for many of these women, this was a way to um, afford, um, so Ethel Bruno talks about being able to afford violin lessons for her children camp, uh, kind of um, being able to, to afford certain things that she wouldn't have been able to afford had she um, worked in another um, area of work. So, yes. Any other questions? Yes. Um, I guess maybe this is more of a question for you, um, but either can anyone can answer. Um, I think it's really refreshing to see uh, vocalists or dancers being in situations where they they have so much agency over their performances and you know like just the yeah their performances and what they exude. And I was just wondering what you think about maybe the relationship between the image of these entertainers back then who were like dan both dancers and vocalists and sort of like the modern day trope that surrounds uh, jazz vocalists, which is sort of like a very sexualized and often undesirable like girl singer trope. Mm -hmm. Like, do you think there's a relationship? Uh, it's a good question. I think because of, the, um, because of the source I've been working at, I mean, I've been working with oral histories of these women, so I'm obviously really interested in 
how they thought about it. And we tend to think about, um, or there's, there's a number of ways in which we think about uh, performance in those contexts. And because they were kind of sexy costumes with fringes and tassels and, and sometimes weird hats with fruit and things like that on their heads, some, sometimes we think, oh, it must have been weird to have to dance kind of half naked. Uh, but actually what comes out of their oral histories is, is actually what you heard from Bernice Jordan is that she actually really much enjoyed it. Um, Mary Brown talks about um, when she was on stage, she felt like she escaped racial prejudice. She didn't feel like she, um, she actually says something like, when I stepped off the stage, you know, people reminded me what color I was. But when I was on stage, I felt glamorous and uh, she didn't, she, she, it was an escape for her from that. Um, and so other women, I mean, all of the women who, who talk in those oral histories, they really talk about um, performance as something that they loved to do, which isn't to say that they didn't encounter abuse from, you know, people who didn't want to pay them. Um, Mary Brown talks about people who put cigarettes through her stockings on the way between, you know, the, the, um, the, the like, on the way up the stage. And so they, they, they had to experience um, forms of abuse, and they tell some of those stories, but really what, they, what comes out of it and how they want to be remembered is that they loved their job, and they actually um, did it for family, as uh, Mr. Wim said earlier, that really they did, as, as uh, your mother said, you know, you don't, as long as you don't do it for yourself just to be glamorous, as, young, as long as you do it for family, you put your money for family, so that's really how they explain that type of thing. And in terms of the, the relationship, the, in terms of creative relationship, well, they, they worked together. They were part of that same scene. And they knew each other really well. Um, they, they worked together all the time. It was like three shows a day, seven shows a week, 52 yeah. weeks a year. So they were part of the same scene, really, the women and the men. And so, so I think it makes more sense to me to imagine them working creatively, collaboratively together as to imagine that there was a jazz ensemble and a dancer showed up and danced to whatever was happening. I think it makes more sense to me. And also having seen the rehearsal this afternoon, how they actually work even today, the kinds of questions that they ask, the kinds of state statements that are made, the kinds of, hey, this tempo doesn't work for me, let's do it faster. Um, I mean, there's a way in which, you know, there's certain tempos that just don't work for certain dances. And so there's a framework that, um, that, that emerges from the very bodies of, of, of dancers that has to be taken into account uh, in, in, in creating a performance. Does that answer your question? Yeah, great. I think we're, I think we're gonna have to stop there, but let's okay. thank very much uh, Vanessa and thank all of you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all for being here today. Thank you everyone. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>